I hit record. I didn't even wait for you to be mid sentence this time. I know. I gave um, you the thumbs up and everything. <laughs> I'm here with Laura Hum. We're doing our 17th ever Q and A. This is our seventh in, in the three and a half years of dial. Maybe four years now. I don't even know. In our 200 something episodes, this is our 17th Q and A. 216 yeah. episodes. 216 episodes. This is the 217th episode, and it's our oh. 17th. I gotta go play the lottery. Seventeen, oh. our winning number. Seventeen's our winner. Um, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Uh, yeah. So before we get into this is an oh, episode. This is gonna be fun. This... <laughs> Jeff's already... in a place. Um, we're, we're, we're already starting off with winner, winner, chicken dinner. It can only go uphill from here. We're downhill. I, don't know. I told you that when I was at school in Texas. There was a radio program I'd listen to every night at like 10 p.m. where they did Waco trivia. And if you got it right, the prize was a free din a free chicken like basket at Bush's chicken. So if you got it right, the guy went, winner, winner, chicken dinner. And I, I used to love it. It was my favorite. Um nice. well, you know, that was before television was invented. Oh, so that just... <laughs> that hurt that hurt my soul um hold on, hold on i have to tell a story okay so I, by the way everybody this is the q a episode where jeff and laura interrupt each other and take way too long to actually get to the questions all right go for it yes, you're welcome and we're sorry but we're not really sorry so not i sorry. was um finishing my master's degree a couple of years ago right um obviously i am at a very different stage in life in a, as a lot of my peers and classmates were so <laughs> one, one um, of my classmates was doing a presentation and was talking about a very well-known psychology case. I'm not going to get into it because it's kind of sad and depressing. But um, she mentions that all of the people living in this apartment building were sitting around in their living rooms. The case happened in the uh, 60s. And she says they were like watching TV if there was TV then, and she looked at me. Oh, no. <laughs> yes, television had been invented too. I was not alive in the 60s. <laughs> oh, that's just rude. It was hilarious that she looked at me and not our professor. Yeah. This, like, we're the same age. <laughs> yeah, I will say, though, you I, I've heard stories about your master's degree and my bet is you were carrying a lot of gravitas at that moment in the room. I mean, uh, yeah, I did have a lot to say in that class. Yeah, my bet is my bet is you were the authority. Maybe she was checking with you to be like, "Is that okay that I said that?" Um, <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, but but what what was really funny about that was that twenty somethings don't know when television was invented. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Um, yeah, I don't know when television was invented, but I'm not going to say that. I know it was invented before 1960, though. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so a couple of announcements before we get into our Q and A's. Uh, I'm not going to go deep into it because if you don't know about it, it's probably too late to get it. But today is the last day that we are selling our summer fall season pass. So you can go to dialogdoctor.com, click on the. Uh, summer and fall events button in the menu and that will take you there and you can sign up for the season pass there but today is the final day that we are selling it and oh, let's talk yeah. about the other thing coming up so by and this is only available until august 1st we're holding a nine week cohort style mastermind called edit yourself like a dialogue doctor in oh, which be a theme song Jeff and JP are going to write a theme song. This is off like a dialogue doctor. JP hates my theme songs. <laughs> I love them. I think they're great. JP hates my theme songs and he hates the titles that I give to our episodes like joints with JP. Um, so um, I kind of agree with him on that one. No, it's great. Um, <laughs> I have the record button. Try and stop me. Um, yes. Can I talk? Can I talk about the the cohort? Oh yeah, please do. Yeah, otherwise I was just going to babble on. So I'm really, really excited about this cohort. This is the cohort that so many people have been asking us for since almost since we started because 
as a participant, you are going to submit a uh, writing piece, a, a short scene around 1500 words. And we're actually going to use those as examples throughout the course. We're going to focus on how to think about your writing as the author, but being able to take your author hat off and look at your writing as if you hadn't written it so that you're the reader. All the things that Jeff, JP, and I think about when we're reading, we're going to teach you those things. And then we're going to do, um, so that'll be one teaching. And then there are going to be four other teachings. Each one of those teachings are going to focus on a different type of editing because editing isn't just editing. There are different things that you want to work on. Sometimes you want to answer a question about your story and that kind of editing is very different than if you're editing for voice or for um, style. Uh, we have just four different ways of looking at editing. So we'll have a session on each of those. The cool thing is between those sessions, we're going to have work weeks that allow you to actually use the examples written by your peers, not by Jeff, JP, and me, which is what we usually use in one of these courses. We're going to be using your work. Um, and we're going to give you time to apply and work on those things so that there will be, when there's Q&A time in the teaching, at the end of the teaching sessions, we can actually pull up our own work and work together on it. So not only are you getting into the dialogue doctor editing mindset, you're learning how to apply it to your own pieces. So I'm really excited about it. That is a, a much better description than I could have given. I think uh, I could have given a pretty good description. Oh, it. you clearly don't listen to the intro <laughs> of the podcast every week. <laughs> so I, I think this one is particularly different for me because, you know, editing is my jam, right? That's right. Like, that's that's what you that's what you do. That's what you do. <laughs> That's what I do. Um, um, so it's really, it's exciting to me to often when we bring editing in, we bring editing in at the end of writing. It's okay, do this to write and then edit yourself this way. Mm -hmm. This I think is the first time we've really focused on editing soup to nuts without really any writing except how writing supports editing. Yeah, a hundred percent. So I get to be the star of this show. <laughs> wow, that was awesome. Um, <laughs> that was my southern diva voice. Yeah, we're talking about accents later, so that's fascinating. I love that you did that. Uh, yeah, so you can go sign up for that if that sounds interesting to you. Uh, sign up at dialoguedoctor.com. Uh, go to the menu button, click on the summer and fall events uh, in the menu, and um, it'll you scroll down. You'll find it there. Uh, and again, it we you have to register by August first. Uh, so go register for that. It's going to be great. Um, yeah, you I think that's all we have to say about register that. Register directly on Teachable. If you're on Teachable, dialoguedoctor.teachable.com. There's a link there. Mm -hmm. There's also Jump a link there. there. You can yeah. register directly with that. Um, and just so that everybody knows, we're setting the cutoff by August first to give everyone who's registered time to select their piece, send mm -hmm. it to us, get that edit um, so that we can use your pieces. If we make the cutoff September 1st, then yeah. we don't really have time to do that. We don't have time to do oh, that. Oh, quick thing. Um, the cohorts will be Wednesday nights, 8 p.m. Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't make it to the cohort, you can still have your scene edited. You are still able to participate. You'll get the recordings. I know um, that can be a difficult time for some people. Um, so if you can't make it that time, don't think that you're just down and out. We'll be available in Slack through the whole nine week cohort. Um, you'll have other opportunities to connect with us in other ways throughout that process. So yeah, don't let Absolutely. Wednesdays scare you. Yeah, don't let Wednesdays don't scare don't scare you. Yeah. Um, there Wednesday was a sentence. The scariest day of the week. There was a sentence in there. I find it to be the most exhausting day of the week. By the end of the day on Wednesday, I'm like, whew, yeah. it's been a week. Um, okay. Adams is named their daughter Wednesday. Is it really? Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. 
I oh. think it was because she was born on a Wednesday, but I don't really know. Oh, okay. I'm just making stuff up at this point. That's fine. Um, yeah, so come register for that. It's going to be fun. Let's transition to questions. You want to transition to questions? Let's transition well, I mean, to questions. We made the declarative statement that we were going to do We're going to transition to questions. Um, I'm already getting lost in thought about the about the, yourself like a dialogue doctor. So let's let's end transition questions. I wonder oh, why you were. That's what I was gonna say. I was looking. There was something in my brain, and I was like, I have to ask this thing. There's only there's only uh, twenty seats for this because it's a cohort model, and five of them are gone. So there's only fifteen seats left. So go. Don't wait. Don't be like, oh, I'll do that on August first. There may not be seats left for you. So if this is something you want to do, go do it. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So we asked the dialoguers for questions. Uh, the dialoguers being the members of our Patreon community, uh, who are also in our Slack, amazing writers that whom we love. I'm just speaking for you, there, Laura. Uh, we asked them for questions, and they sent us questions. So we're gonna work Sorry, through those questions. Really long time to process what you were saying there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? Okay. That's the best. Yeah, I like to Here talk as fast as I can so that people can't catch up to me and realize that uh, I'm like not saying things. Uh, so um, first question is for both of us. How do you feel these days? That was the first question. How do you feel these days? That wasn't the question. The question was, how old do you feel these days? Oh, I miss the old. That's how old <laughs> I feel these days. Ooh, you know what? I actually copied it from the Slack onto the page correctly, but I have been reading it wrong. <laughs> That's why you were making those old jokes earlier yes! before we hit record. Yes! We're on the same page now. I thought you were just making fun of me. Um... <laughs> I, would never, I would never just make fun of you. Well, I mean, that's not true. Right, come on. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But there's a, there was a reason to it. Yeah, it's okay. You've tolerated me for 18 years. You're allowed to you're allowed to make fun of me whenever you want now. We've been friends for a long time. We've been friends for a long time. Um. Okay. So, how old do you feel these days? <laughs> Ooh, I feel so old. I can't read the questions. Uh, I am. Um, I need my bifocals. Let me. How see. old am I actually? That's a good question. How old am I? Do you want me to tell the listeners because you and I are the same age? No, we're not. We I'm much older than you. No, you're not. You're only a month Damn older it. than me. Yeah, no, you can tell months. the... I, well, I don't want to tell your age. I don't mind my age being told. I don't care. I mean, okay. I can't do anything about it. Yeah. Wait, let me guess. We are 47. Not yet, but we will be on our next birthday. Yes! I didn't realize we're the same age. Why do I always think you're younger than I am? Probably I'm because you're more youthful. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> Because of my youthful southern appearance. <laughs> Mark that for the accent discussion to come in a minute. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I told yeah. you there are a lot of voices in my head. There, when yeah. I let them come out my mouth, all we got hold some of my... Yeah, I'm 47. How? How? 40? I'm not. I'm almost. Um, how do I? How old do I feel? I feel like 86 on the inside. I, that's how old I feel. I've, I've, but I've felt that way since I was a teenager. So there's a... Yeah. <laughs> I'm perpetually an angry old man on the inside. Um, yeah. No. I don't know. How old do you feel? I waffle between feeling like I'm still in my 20s and feeling like I'm like 107. Yeah, this is how old I feel. My college daughter, age daughter watched reality bites uh do you remember reality bites ethan hawk winona Ryder. i never watched it but yeah I remember. greatest soundtrack of any movie ever um she watched it and she kept making me explain things to her like why doesn't she just call him on her cell phone yeah oh yeah i've had that conversation a lot of times <laughs> why is that guy sitting in that newsstand i was like y you live in new york She's like, yeah, I, I've never seen one of those. I'm like, okay. But yeah, so anyway, it was... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Did you know that movie takes place in Houston? I've always put it in my brain on the East Coast, but it takes place in Houston. <laughs> I never watched it. I was anyway. not an Ethan Hawke fan. 
oh. I could go either way with Winona Ryder. For yeah. some reason, it just reminded me of a poor version of Christian Slater and Pump Up the Volume. Which was one of the greatest movies of all time. All movie lovers just turned this off and, and like went and died. That's what just how you just killed like several hundred movie lovers. <laughs> Reality Bites is a poor version of Christian Slater's Pump Up the Volume. That's I love it. That's fantastic. I'm here for that. that's the statement of the of the show. That's the that one wins. Um I can't top that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm hoping Ethan Hawke will be on our next Q and A to defend himself. To defend his, I don't think he will. But I mean, hey, if he if he, does, if he wants to come on, movie. oh, oh man, that's quite an offer. How could yeah. anybody turn that down? Yeah. Um, but if you haven't seen it, definitely go back and watch Pump Up the Volume. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm, I am. I haven't seen that. I don't even know what it is, and I will go find it and watch <laughs> yeah, when, it when 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 you find it. The name David Deaver will always be in your mind (laughs) (laughs) because Christian Slater was a, he, and I think it was Winona (sighs) Ryder. um, I feel like Winona Ryder was in every movie from those times. So yes, it was Winona Ryder. Yeah. Yeah. He, they created a pirate radio station and when they came after them, they moved it into his Jeep. So she was driving around in his Jeep and he was, broadcasting and they were like driving through the mountains and stuff but um he was like challenging i think it was his father whose name was david deaver and they they remixed it so it's like da- david 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 deaver david nice deaver. so i like you can't i don't know yeah i, I did the movie itself holds up but yeah I, well i'm gonna find out i did show my kids uh bill and ted's excellent adventure recently mm. how does that hold up it holds up you know what yeah. it holds up until the end it's actually funny they were laughing they thought it was hysterical they couldn't believe that john wick played that part they were very impressed oh, by john wick playing. <laughs> like, wait a minute john wick wasn't in it playing. <laughs> i mean okay uh bill um yeah they're very impressed um so but and the jokes were so funny there's a weird moment though a couple weird moments that like kind of freaked my kids out and one of them is Billy the Kid has guns in a mall. Yeah. <laughs> and my my son was like, I this is the most unrealistic part of this movie. And I was like, you live in a different time. And then in the end also, you live in a different state because that's there true. are lots of malls. And you're that's your, true. Your son lives your son goes to school in a state where it would not be unusual. That's true. This he goes to, yeah, he goes to school in Texas. My Everybody's got a gun in a mall. Gun. It just tripped them out that he was like shooting guns in public. And then to get everyone's attention in the auditorium to start their like ending presentation, Billy the Kid pulls out his gun and shoots out a spotlight. And everybody in the audience just claps. And my daughter was like, no way in hell if somebody pulls out a gun in an auditorium, (laughs) I just clap it. She's like, that's not happening. I was like, yeah, this movie was made pre mass shooting like time in america so yeah it was just that was the only thing that didn't that was weird it was like oh this is strange yeah but um otherwise the comedy was good yeah but that's how old i feel i feel showing my kids bill and ted's excellent adventure old that's nice. um yeah nice. it's showing them old movies is like a hit or miss like yeah reality but my 14 year old came in when juliana juliana only made it for the, through the first 45 minutes of reality bites and then she turned it off and she watched the wedding planner with j-lo um so which is one of her favorites so but in the middle of watching rally bites the first 30 minutes my 14 year old walked in sat down on the couch looked at the tv and went hey stranger things because we're not a writer it's also <laughs> stranger things i go yeah she's in stranger things and then he watched it for a couple of minutes he goes she's better in stranger things and then he walked off <laughs> i was like all right thank you for your opinion on Mm. Winona Ryder's career. But anyway, so any more comments on how old you feel? No, I think that about sums it up. That about sums it up. Yeah. Um. Okay. Second question for both of us: Getting back on track after a hiatus. Any tips? 
you can't answer this because you don't actually ever take hiatuses. So even on vacation, you're working. Well, so you're not allowed to answer this. <laughs> but I do often just unplug and disconnect for like four or five days at a time. When That's I, true. When I get to a place where I am just completely overwhelmed. Yeah, you, you, you binge and purge work. You like, yes. Yeah. yeah. I will, Ma I will. Maximum activity and then like batteries die for four days and then you're back. Yeah. 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 No, I, uh, yeah, I find that I don't know that it's a healthy cycle, but it's, a it's the cycle that I have created for myself. <laughs> so. Any, t any tips on, uh, recharging and coming back? Um, <clears throat> I guess, like, in the spirit of the question of, like, how do you get back into it? Um, I think that there are two approaches to it. Cocaine. Um, I mean, obviously, <laughs> cocaine is always the answer. I don't do cocaine. I promise. I do. It is amazing <laughs> to me how often cocaine comes up in my just everyday conversation. Though. We talk about it a lot, even though neither of us have ever done it. We do talk <laughs> about cocaine quite often. Yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. We talked um, about it today at work. We talked we about cocaine. And then we talked about it today before we turned on the podcast recording. Did we? Number we did. We now. did talk about it. Yeah. 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 I think it's become so ubiquitous in our conversation now that most of the time we don't even notice it. That's right. Do you just... like my use of the word ubiquitous? I was impressed. It's I, ever present. I cocaine is ever word. present in our, com yeah. in our conversation. Yeah. I like to use words that sound fun. So I just when i it's a fun sounding word it is it's, it's like splendiferous like boring, but yeah. what, what word did you use splendiferous oh i've never used that one it's not a word yeah <laughs> okay i mean it sounds like a word it's not but it doesn't sound as fun as anyway it doesn't matter i'm digressing us um okay so there are, in my opinion and it's just an opinion um the band-aid theory works really well you can mm. either Pull the band off, pull the band-aid off slowly. So you kind of like spread the getting back into it slowly. Or you can just rip it off and just jump right back in. Um, and I think it depends on what kind of person you are. Um, you could also use jumping into a swimming pool. You either walk down the stairs or you jump into the freezing cold pool. That works as well. Um for me, I find that if I don't just cannonball in or rip that Band-Aid off, I'm just going to extend my hiatus until I'm ready to do mm -hmm. it. Um, starting slow for me is not successful because if I start slow, even though the starting is often the hardest part, um, something will happen <clears throat> and I'll get frustrated and I'll be like, no, if I'm not ready for this and I'll walk away mm -hmm. versus if I just jump in full force with it. Um, so I think my biggest tip is know what makes you successful and lean into that method or model because uh, what works for somebody else might not work for you good tip that's a good tip um what's yours i'll go um specifically toward writing when you drop a project for a while and then try to pick it back up mm -hmm. uh I will. I, before I say that, I will say the Dialogue Doctor support team was just. Um, that's a group of dialoguers that meet on Saturday mornings to like help each other with our careers. Uh, but we we just were looking at Atomic Habits, the book, and mm -hmm. he had an interesting suggestion in Atomic Habits, which I've I've been thinking a lot about since we discussed it. Which is the problem with motivation is usually the first three minutes of an activity. So. He was like, the example he used is working out. He was like, don't tell yourself you're going to go work out. Because saying like, okay, now I'm going to go work out. The workout is too big a task. Mm -hmm. Instead say, whatever the first thing you do to go work out is, do that, focus on doing that thing. So like, mm -hmm. I'm going to put on my gym clothes to go work out. And if mm -hmm. you put your gym clothes on, you're more likely to go work out. So he was like, look at the first step. So like for writing, it's like, okay, I don't need to tell myself tonight, I'm going to write a chapter. I need to focus on the like, I'm going to sit down and put my hands on the keyboard. Because mm -hmm. if I sit down and put my hands on the keyboard, then I'm going to write the chapter. But that's more motivation stuff. Um, it was an interesting concept. But I find when I'm getting back into a project after being out of it for a long time, there's two things I have to do. One, I have to read everything I've written in the project. Mm -hmm. I can't pick, I cannot assume that I remember anything. 
Um, and I usually, I usually am misremembering what I wrote. Um, that's been, and I think every book I've ever written, I've done, I've done this multiple times. I've picked them up and put them down and picked mm-hmm. them up and put them down. And I, I will just forget things. And so, um, I do have to read through everything I've written. Well, and I, I think that's, sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but I'm going to interrupt you. I think that's a really <clears throat> normal thing because even when we talked about this in the last dash a lot, <clears throat> even when you're writing a story and you're not actively working on the story most of the time you're thinking about the story yeah so thinking about what you want your characters to do who you want your characters to be what your plot points are it makes a lot of sense that you're remembering what you want to do more than what you actually did yeah and i find my threshold is like if i don't work on it once a week if i let a full Mm -hmm. week go by without working on a project then i've forgotten things and I need to like refresh. So hmm. I will read, I'll read through everything. And then, um, then, and I usually like, if I read the first chapter, I'm like, oh, I remember. Like, I just need that like mm-hmm. memory jog, but I'll, I will read through everything. And then the second thing I do is I, I try to find a new way to take notes. So, hmm. and part of this is because I like to explore new tools. I like to do new things. So, you know, I'll try to like build a spreadsheet in a new way to take notes on, or I'll take notes like with different colored pencils this time or on like Mm -hmm. a pad or like this time I'm just, I'm actually just not doing this last night. I actually, we wrote nerds episode 18. I don't even know when we, for season two, I don't even know when JP and I wrote it. It was so long ago. It may have been a full year ago and I haven't touched Mm -hmm. season two since then. I'm the problem. It's me. And I just, um, I just picked it back up yesterday. So it's like, okay, I, I finished a project. My head's clear now. I need to get back into nerd season two. I picked up, a, a, I picked up and I, I was like, this time I'm going to do a bullet journal as I reread through it because I've never yeah. done a bullet journal. I've always wanted to try one. I want to know what they're like. So let's do a bullet journal for this thing. So it's like, it. I get motivated by playing with new tools. So that's the second thing I do is as I'm picking something back up to make it not feel like a slog. I do, I try to embrace it in a new way and look at it in a new way. Like I've written them all on, I remember one time I picked a book back up. I writ, I wrote everything on note cards and then posted note cards on the wall. Um, you know, one time I'd like, I did it by scenes. One time I did it by like, I had a different, I had a different line going for each POV. Like, you know, I just play with things, but the new, like playing with new stuff helps keep me motivated to pick things back up. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that those are, <clears throat> those are great tools that the, just think about the first thing or use a new tool. I think those are great for, cause those are things that motivate you. Yeah. <laughs> I, it was funny. Cause as you were talking, I was like, oh, I like a new spreadsheet. And I often use a tool like that as a distraction for me like oh, that's I know really funny. I'm supposed to do something so I will create a spreadsheet to make it easier um that's really funny. then I'll just spend like three hours on the spreadsheet, the spreadsheet instead of doing the thing I'm supposed to do and this idea of like just focus on the first three minutes yeah I'm gonna focus on putting my gym clothes on and then I'm gonna cross that off my list and I'm gonna put my gym clothes <laughs> If you're going to eat ice cream in your gym clothes. Um, <laughs> and I think that, but I think that's where it comes back into like knowing yourself and yeah. what works for you um, and where this individualization of tools mm-hmm. works differently because everybody's motivated by something different. I'm motivated by finishing a task. So if yeah. I can focus on the end of something instead of the beginning of something, I am much more likely to do it Mm -hmm. because I like the dopamine hit of finishing, whereas other people get really motivated by like a new beginning or a new start, like you with the new tools. Yeah. Well, it it does change. Like when I was first started to write and I had a nine-year-old seven, no, he was 11, nine, seven, four, and, um, newborn was when Mm -hmm. i first started writing 
uh, I had all five of those. Those were my five, right. my kids' five first ages. Started writing fiction. Fiction. So when I first started a lot writing fiction, longer than that. I have. When I first started writing fiction, I used to like to make myself write. I would be like, okay, to to like go write. I mean, to to write fiction. I'm going to like treat myself by writing in a certain place. Mm -hmm. And like, it was like the moving and going because like getting out of the house was a treat. So it was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to go. So pairing the medicine that you need to take, which for me in picking up a project is mm -hmm. the like rereading everything, pairing it with a spoonful of sugar and figuring out what that spoonful of sugar is for you. Can like pairing those two things together can help nice. pick a project back up. Yeah. Um, I love that for you. And I, I what I really appreciated about it is you know yourself well enough to know like this is why this technique works for you. Yeah. It's not just something that you tried one day and was like, oh yeah, that worked. I'm going to keep doing that. Yeah. You know why it's. Well, and it changes because like now if you're like, hey, do you want to go right at a coffee house? I'd be like, why? It's so far away. I have to put pants on. Like, you know, so. <laughs> Now I'm like, I don't want to leave my house. But back then I was like, oh, get me out of here. So it's like right. that, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, the the desire to get out of the house is reversely proportional to the number of children in the house. In the house, that's true. It's, as they're going away to college, I'm like, this place is kind of nice. Um, <laughs> is that true? I like having them around. Uh, yeah. Okay, next question. Next question. We're moving on. Um, All right. <clears throat> So we're going to talk about the next, we got a whole bunch of questions, but we're going to talk about them in three big blocks. Yes, but as quick shout questions. out to everyone who posted questions. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Without you, we couldn't do these episodes because, you know, leave it to Jeff and me to pick questions. I mean, that's not true. I just make things up. But... <laughs> I mean... Have you not listened to a time with Tom? Oh, yeah. I just make things up. Uh, so anyway, but thank you for the questions. The questions make it better. Um, <laughs> we still do the episode. Uh, okay, so. I mean, would we? Wouldn't we just sit here and talk about reality, reality bites and cocaine? I'd for... probably just lie to you. I'd be like, hey, I got a bunch of questions through Patreon. Uh, yes, except then I would be like, let me see them. Who sent them? I was, <laughs> I was so skeptical and untrusting. I'm like, no. No, no yeah, I got to see it. Proof? receipts receipts um okay so our first topic is uh editing tactics and processes when it comes to editing a character voice yes hey you know what we should do in on on august 1st we should start a uh mini editing. mastermind that talks yeah. all about editing your character voices we should probably actually run it in september though okay just make people register people have to sign up by august 1st, 1st. Yeah, yeah that makes sense yeah yeah yeah. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. Because this is actually something that I think a lot of people want to know and probably is going to be part of the process. It's probably going to be a whole week of the five weeks on editing character voices. <laughs> you yeah. like how I, I like seamlessly slid that plug in there? That was I'm getting so, good. so much better at this. 217 episodes, and I'm actually figuring this stuff out. Yep. yep. I still and don't know no how to post one... videos on YouTube, though, but no edits. But I'm. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's okay, because um, I'm glad you brought up YouTube, because if you go to the YouTube channel, there is a video of me, someone selected me to be part of their online conference. They requested you. Week. They didn't just select you, they requested you. I don't know that they were. They were like, we would like Laura to be a part of our online conference. That was the email said, I got. We would like the dialogue doctor. They didn't and then say they that. Got, they, they, got, they got me as a like, that's, that's not true at all. All right, processes right. for editing character but voice. We we got, about, we got, the reason I brought it up is because we talked specifically, one of the things we talked about was editing character voices. Oh, okay. It was part of the mistakes that people make when they're editing is they nice. miss muddy voices. And there are some tips and suggestions in there. Nice. You are on YouTube it's not on the podcast. We didn't make it a podcast episode, but it is in yeah. YouTube if you. It's in the YouTube's. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Okay. No, you're um, good. Are you answering this question or am I answering? This I think we're just talking about it. Okay. Well, you go you first. Talk first. Okay. Um. <clears throat> so, things to think about when you're editing. Um. Most of the time, I would suggest that you 
think about your character voice before you write, but don't let yourself get bogged down in voices when you're writing. Because if you can't hear the voice in your head, which is how I talk about it, or put the voice in your mouth the way Jeff talks about it, um, then just write the characters in your own voice and then save character voices for editing, mm -hmm. especially if you're not really sure how to apply the voice, uh, excuse me, words, cadence, pacing, and body language, which are the components of voice. <laughs> if you're not sure how to do that, um, then definitely do it in editing. Um, and then when you go to work on voice, start with your main character's baseline voice mm -hmm. and find a scene where your character is in their baseline voice and edit that scene first. If you decide that you want to um, do the dash, in the dash workbooks, there is a secret decoder ring for applying words, cadence, pace, not pacing, words, cadence, and body language. Pacing you need other characters for, so it's not in the decoder ring. Mm -hmm. um, there's an exercise in there that shows you examples of how to take a statement and make it unique for a voice. So my recommendation is to do that whole scene at the baseline of that character's voice and then find another scene that's in the character's baseline voice and do that one and nice. then find a modulation and go through it. It is a time consuming process to go scene by scene like that, but I definitely think it makes the reader's experience much better when you take the time to put that consistency in. And if it's your main character or your vehicle character, then all of the other characters around them will need to shift their dialogue by focusing on the primary. Um, it gets you the ability to kind of hone the voice that you need first and then yeah. bring the others around it. And I will say, don't assume, I like what you're saying. We shouldn't assume that the first scene a character in is in is their baseline voice. A lot of times, especially if you're writing like a thriller or you're writing an action novel, um, that opening scene has punch to it. Mm -hmm. So it's possible mm -hmm. that that opening scene, you know, maybe that opening scene is like a courtroom drama where things are really heightened. Mm -hmm. Or if your character is one of the lawyers, their their voice is modulated to that professional tone as opposed to how they're going to sound for most of the novel when they're with their friends. So like, is I think what you're saying is important to find that baseline. Don't assume the first... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first time we hear this character, that's how they normally sound. Mm -hmm. Edit those baseline scenes first and then come back to the modulated scenes. Yep. So you can really pull that difference out. Yeah, absolutely. That's really smart. And, and as we're talking about baseline, <clears throat> baseline doesn't have to be calm. Like sometimes we think about baseline being like the touch point. So, sorry. Sometimes we think about baseline being like, no emotion and then we modulate emotion from there baseline is where your character spends most of their time or yes. where your reader spends most of the time so if you have a um a, if you're writing a romance novel if most of your story <clears throat> is in that will they won't they decision making that heightened sense of should i or shouldn't i becomes your baseline voice not the place where they're with their best friend and they're calm and they're just relaxed and having fun mm -hmm. and not the scenes where they're intimate. It's that kind of decision-making will I, should I, shouldn't I, will I, won't I, um, that becomes your baseline. So. Yeah. And can I add an interest, a fun yeah. like meta conceptual twist to that? So let's say you're like, Oh, my character is calm and charming. But they spend the entire like they but we only have like three scenes of them being calm and charming, and we have like fifteen scenes of will I won't I anxiety mm -hmm. around what's happening. Your character is not calm and charming. Your reader sees your character as anxious and will I won't I because your reader interprets the character's personality through the voice. So if you have fifteen yeah. scenes where your character is like anxious, you're writing an anxious character. <laughs> who modulates to calm and charming when they're in specific circumstances. Right. So like, it's just something to think about. Like when you define your character personality, know that the majority of the time that your reader spends with the character is how your reader defines the character's personality. So yeah. Just oh, a, that's such a good point. Just a fun yeah. meta point there. Like, <laughs> Yeah. Well, and to take that just a little bit further, 
Um, often we describe our characters based off of where they are at the end of our story, mm -hmm. what we want them to be, what we want them to learn, not where they start. Yeah. And that becomes a big, a big like talking point for ourselves as well when we're writing. Who am I writing? Often we're writing the journey, not the destination, but yeah. we see our characters as the destination character. Mm -hmm. Happens all the time when I'm working with like science fiction or fantasy authors. I'm like, okay, so yeah. tell me about your character. Like, well, she's a badass. I'm like, is she a badass or is she becoming a badass? Right. Oh, she's becoming a badass. I'm like, all right, two different things. Right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. Often readers don't want to read a story about someone who is already a hero not to say that there aren't stories out there where there are heroes but they're usually stories of fall they're like tragedies if right. your character starts a hero they've got nowhere to give it down <laughs> right right or they are flawed in some way everyone looks at them as a hero we're going to talk about reacher a little bit later like reacher is in his books as a hero but he's kind of an anti-hero yeah he's a mess <laughs> He's a mess. He has all of that these, dude's a mess. Right? Yeah. Like, and the people around him are changing, but he's he in and of himself is not really that interesting of a character. The books are great. He draws people back in mm -hmm. because he is focused on his moral compass. He's not willing to like make any changes to his moral compass. The people around him bend and change, and that mm -hmm. makes him fun to read. But if you were to put him in any other circumstance, that character... Who is this giant homeless man? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He um, kind of does whatever he wants. Yeah. Uh, Why did he was, punch that guy? Yeah. Yeah. I think about the beginning of the first Incredibles movie when Mr. Incredible is working in the... Um, in the insurance office mm -hmm. and yeah. he's in the, this giant man in this teeny tiny cubicle <laughs> and it's like it's only like six minutes of the movie and it's so, oh, it's so utterly funny. painful yeah. it's so perfect yeah so. yeah um would you if somebody's struggling with like multiple character voices like okay mm -hmm. i got four characters do you recommend editing the voices one at a time or editing through scenes oh this is a great question and the answer is, it depends. It depends on what the problem is in the scene. Everybody Sorry. drink. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Whatever Jeff and Laura says, it depends in a Q&A episode. Everybody drink. That's yeah. right. Um, we have to say it at least once. So if your problem in the scene that you're editing is you don't have enough emotional intensity in the scene, you're going to have to edit all your voices at the same time because often emotional intensity or lack of emotional intensity is coming because your characters aren't modulating their voices mm -hmm. at the, or you've started out with too much emotion and there's nowhere to waver in emotion emotion. We think about, Oh, they were angry. And we think about anger as one thing, but anger doesn't always look the same. Mm -hmm. There's anger directed at someone else. There's anger directed at ourselves. There's shame and anger. There's disappointment and anger. There's frustration and anger, right? Like there's so much nuance to it mm -hmm. and really understanding where the nuance is helps us modulate those voices. Um, so if you're worried about emotional intensity, editing all of the voices at one time is going to give you a better result in emotional intensity. If the problem that you're working on is that your character voice feels inconsistent, then you're going to want to work on one character voice throughout your whole story, working on scenes a group at a time based off of the modulation and mm -hmm. making sure that that voice feels consistent. Um, if you're working on consistency and character voice, it's very difficult to work on multiple voices at the same time because remembering which voice is which can can make for a muddy scene. Yeah. So. All right. Side question. Another side question um, that we get asked all the time. Oh, okay. I actually got to ask it today because there was a person I, I had a I had a person uh, I was doing a session early this morning and the uh, the scene was very dull and 
<laughs> I was like, hey, why did we make this scene so dull? Because it's a high action scene. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, it, it's kind of dull in real life. I'm like, yeah, but we ain't writing no real life, right? Like it was a courtroom scene. And I'm like, yeah, I've been to court. Court sucks. Yeah. It's very dull. But what we want in fiction is Tom Cruise making Jack Nicholson yell. You can't handle the truth. Nice. So where do we draw the line between realism and entertainment in our dialogue? That is a really great question. Um, and I will say we draw that line at the time where we can use movie references from this decade <laughs> instead of from before the turn of the century. <laughs> <laughs> How old do you feel, Laura? So I mean, I think even the first Incredibles is 20 years old now. Oh, yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> here's the thing about dialogue and real life versus reality. People do not read books to experience reality. People read books to experience real emotion. Mm -hmm. And we don't read books about Joe Schmo sitting in a regular everyday office. There has to be some appeal that feels different in what we're reading. It's why science fiction fantasy is so exciting. It's why romance is so exciting. It's why uh, hero's journey or heroine's journey stories are so compelling. It's because characters are doing something that we don't feel like we have in our own real life. Mm. Um, Even stories that are like coming of age, the reason they're exciting, yes, they're everyday things. They're what's happening in our lives but it's at a heightened sense of emotion. It's even Mm. biographies are not written with every moment of someone's life. It highlights the big, important emotional elements, Mm. not just, it was Monday. I got up and I made myself breakfast and I took a shower and I brushed my teeth and I drove into work and there was a lot of traffic, right? Like we all experience that in our everyday lives. And it can feel really overwhelming to be in your own life. So moving to the excitement of the story, the excitement of the character voice, Mm -hmm. focusing on the things that are important to the scene in the moment, even if you have to push the bounds of reality a little bit to jump time and place or to heighten emotion, you have to stay within the realm of realism, but you don't have to say everything exactly as a character would say. Um, we do it. We do it when we watch television too, right? Like mm-hmm. people monologue a lot. I mean, despite the fact that I'm monologuing on a podcast, um, <laughs> like in general, most of the time, conversation is a lot of back and forth. It's not just one person telling a story start to finish there's interruptions there's um stutters we don't often put stutters into dialogue because it's distracting for the reader um it if you have a character who stutters yes you want to put it in there but you only want to use it for the character that stutters the articulate characters you want to remove their ums and their uhs unless they're intentionally lying or something because it's distracting to the reader so yeah i think in general good dialogue walks a line between feeling real like something would say and then being a little sharper than reality Mm -hmm. sharper emotionally sharper efficiently right like there's a lot of meandering in normal conversations whereas in you know well-written dialogue there's less being in there. And I was actually watching a movie and reading the screenplay while I watched it recently. It was a movie with Vince Vaughn, but it was not a normal Vince Vaughn movie. Um, and just kind of seeing how it rolled out. And he has a conversation at the front door with a woman about what she's wearing. And it, the dialogue didn't quite work. And because one, it was meandering and it felt like, 
oh, this is something somebody would really say at a front door, and I don't mm-hmm. want to see this. And like, right. it was a weird, like, this is a weird, I'm getting too much realism here. Like, I don't need to see this exchange. Yeah, realism is <laughs> yeah. boring. It's boring. And so there is, but at the same time, the more like fanciful you make the dialogue, the more sharp you make it, the more you're having your reader interpret your characters in a different way. So like if everything a character says is witty, that becomes the character's personality. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 It's, it's really funny that you talk about that. It's like, there's a sweet spot where it has to be realistic enough to feel real, but it can't be so realistic. Um, There's, there have been some studies on the use of avatars um Mm. about that same thing avatars that don't look human enough are weird and creepy yeah but then they hit a threshold where everybody feels like yeah this is what an avatar should look like but then if you push further and it becomes too realistic people start getting creeped out by them again Um, and it's the same thing with those voices you want to and i like the like the sharpen Mm -hmm. word that you're using um i think focusing like a camera lens as well can can be a a good uh, though we do use focus in a lot of other ways so i probably wouldn't use it there but that that heightened um yeah i like that yeah there's a yeah everyone listen to jeff on that yay all right let's switch to our character voice questions since we're talking about that um okay so since we were just talking about this um and I used my great southern accent. You used your great southern accent. So give let's talk about using character voices that have accents or from another country, maybe that don't speak English. Mm-hmm. I would like to hear your answer on this one first. Because you made me answer the other one first. I like it when you answer first. You have a good things to say. Um, good things to say. And too. of course, you gave I me think, this one. I uh, think mine is going to be a little controversial here, so okay. I'll let you go first. Well, I'm going to be a grump, and I'm going to say, well, so the key to using any accent is consistency. That's that's. Uh, there's two keys. The first key is consistency. If somebody has an accent, they have to have it all the way through, and the accent has to be the same. But you can't like. Um, not Kevin Costner in Robin Hood Prince of Thieves. Ouch! Shots fired. I'm leaning boop, into boop, now. all yeah. the '90s and 2000 movies. We're just we're pulling them all out. Into it. And um, again, if Kevin Costner would like to come on this podcast and defend his accent in that movie, I'm yeah. all for it. Or Russell Crowe and Les Mis. Could we throw him in there too? Sure. Um, so I'll put Russell Crowe too. So. <laughs> It has to be consistent throughout your book. So if a, if a group of people or a character has an accent, they they always have to have it unless they intentionally modulate out of it. And when they intentionally modulate out of it, that modulation needs to make sense and be transparent to the reader, yeah. right? Like it can't be something that just randomly happens. It has to have purpose and reason. The second thing I would say around using accents or languages from another country is that it has to be respectful especially if it's a real if you're doing real accents we can talk for a minute about fantasy sci-fi accents because that's a little different but if you're using real life accents like you have a character who uses an irish accent it better be a respectful irish accent um and you better get it checked by sensitivity readers because Mm -hmm. it's not you know that can what you think is harmless may not be and so just just be aware as somebody who uses a lot of sensitivity readers for my books a lot mm-hmm. that you yeah you you got to get that stuff checked it's very quick it's very quick and easy to verge into mocking and not knowing you're doing it um and that's uh, my guess is that's not why you're writing the story or the accent you're not writing the accent because you want to make fun of somebody you're writing the accent because uh, it says something about your story. It gives it like texture and location in a certain place. And that's that's important to you for the story. And you not if you're writing an accent to mock somebody, don't write that book. But if you, yeah, so 
that's my those are my two cents on accents uh what would you say um i think that you are have a, everything that you said is 100 percent spot on but i think your response is a lot more generous than mine is <laughs> um, i thought i was being mean <laughs> don't why are you doing an accent in a book you don't need it i know i know i'm the worst and uh, they invited me they invited me to do the closing ceremonies of this author to uh writers conference yeah and they were we were just killing time waiting for um them to select the winners to the giveaways and they were talking about um including backstory in their like world building in their books and they asked me they're like laura from a uh, from an editor's perspective, how do you feel about this? I was like, um, I'm not going to be invited back because I'm going to tell you as a reader, I don't care about your world. <laughs> yeah, stop it. Like, yeah. Hey, I didn't understand Mercerism in the book that inspired Blade Runner until the last chapter. So <laughs> let's just say he had a whole religion in there that he didn't tell. And people love that book. He didn't need to tell me about the religion in chapter one. <laughs> I, he rolled it out very slowly, and it was beautiful. I don't need to know the whole religion in chapter one. You can keep that religion until the end of the book. I don't need it. Yeah, anyway. Well, and, and that's what I told him. I was like, but my job as an editor is to help writers take the vision that they have in their head of world building, building and put it on a page so your readers care about it. Yeah. Right? Like, but most of the time, the reader isn't there. There are readers who read stories for world building. Absolutely. And I don't want to at all discount their experience in it. But if you're trying to hit the whole audience, then you need to make sure that your world building is exciting. And the reason I bring world building up as it relates to um, accents is that an accent can be a barrier to a reader, mm -hmm. especially if you have a reader who has who isn't a strong reader or is a newer reader mm -hmm. or has reading disabilities the play of the words and the stylization of the words can become a real barrier to understanding. Mm. And you want your barriers to be really, really low in reading your book because you want to save those barriers for exciting things like plot twists and wondering about the whodunit or wondering about, can we win this war, right? Like you want them, you want your readers thinking about the things that you want them thinking about. You don't want your reader going, I don't understand what this character is saying. So yeah, I think your advice is much more practical because mine is like, just don't do it unless you absolutely have to. But I will add to your three or your two and make it three. And add, you have to not just have the sensitivity readers, but you have to do your work and you have to do your research on understanding what that accent or what that language is. Because the nuance of accents, mm -hmm. I mean, there are whole studies done about the difference between accents in different parts of the country. And we have a pretty big country, but if you like look at accents in a space as small as the United Kingdom. How many accents are there there? And the implications of those impacts, like mm -hmm. where your character is from, discredits you to readers if you aren't using them, like you said, respectfully. But that means you have to do the work on it. You can't rely strictly on your um, sensitivity readers to tell you what's right and wrong. Um, your sense that's not your sensitivity readers like it's not your sensitivity readers job to correct it for you it's your sensitivity readers job to tell you how it lands yeah so do the work and i, I will add to that let's let, i have two caveats for that so the first one is just hypothetically i'm portuguese and I, my first language is Portuguese. I'm writing an English novel. I would like to write some characters that speak Portuguese, but I'm writing for English speakers. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's fantastic. Love that you're bringing like that heritage into what you're yep. doing. Um, make sure that there's a translator in the scene. And by a translator, what I mean is make sure there's a character in the scene that also doesn't speak Portuguese mm -hmm. so that someone is having to translate what's happening for that character. 
And that'll that'll help you mm, keep I the reader that. engaged and not just reading a language they may not understand. Right. Yeah. Like so get that translator in there. Another one is like another one we get all the time is like broken English. Um, I have, you know, I'm gonna I have a character that doesn't speak English, they're gonna speak broken English. And, and again, like that goes back to like the respectful. Like, mm -hmm. Make sure you're being respectful with it. Um yeah. the other caveat is sci-fi fantasy novels. I'm not writing real accents. I'm writing accents. I'm writing belters who speak in belter. That's from uh, the Expanse novels. I'm writing belter isms. Mm -hmm. Like to build your, so I think it's important as you build a language, not, this isn't about being respectful. This is about authenticity of the world you're creating. It's important when you're writing a, a different language or an accent or like people that speak in a different language, trying to speak in the language of your vehicle character, your main character. Um, why are their languages different is the question you have to ask, like you have to mm -hmm. answer. And languages form through isolation and accents and regions form through isolation. So like the expanse does it well with like the belters who live on the belt, the asteroid belt around the planet, because they never see anybody that isn't a belter. So mm -hmm. through generations, they formed their own way of speaking. And mm -hmm. that's, that's how accents form. Often when you're writing sci-fi and fantasy, those accents actually are commentary on social class. And it would be a shame to create an accent or a language and not and miss out on that commentary on social class. So just putting that in there, like, you know, so I'm actually working on, <laughs> oh. I'm working on a future, I'm, I'm in the planning stages. I'm working on a novel that takes place in the future about a runaway princess who has run away from her kingdom because she wants to be a professional dodgeball player. Oh. And she's <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't know if this novel will ever happen, but I'm into it. And she's I'm actually like redesigning dodgeball and how dodgeball works in the future. Anyway, she's um <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait. You know when you're my first editor. Um so she's she's gonna um so there's a group of like I am there are there's it's the book is has a lot of commentary on social class and like mm -hmm. how social classes operate. And so I am giving an accent, like I'm thinking about developing an accent for the kind of slum area that she goes to live in. Mm -hmm. And um, the way I'm, I'm actually using having dialogue with chat GPT to figure out how to do that just as like a dialogue partner, like giving them like, Hey, here are the circumstances. What are like 15 different ways language might be shaped? in those circumstances it'll give me 15 i might use like one or two i'll be like oh those two are interesting i hadn't thought of before so that's uh that's like you know that's just kind of a fun way to use ai to start developing those mm -hmm. languages but again i think when you're building languages for fantasy sci-fi to go back to the main point the point is why why do that why do they have a different accent or a different language or a different you know why are they why do they speak the way they do yeah so I think why is important, but the other piece that I would add on to it, and you're doing this, and this is what I think is really important, is understanding language. The reason that people speak Klingon is because there was a linguist at some point involved in the creation of the language. Language doesn't just exist because, you, you know, so we 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 hear all the time about twins or children who are very close siblings creating their own language. Mm -hmm. That's not the creation of language. You can't just look at a ball and call it a bobbit. And now that's language, right? Yeah. Like you, you have to, you have to understand how language is created in order to understand language, things like conjugation yeah. and language is more than and... word replacement. Right. It's not exactly. just word replacement. Yeah. Not to say that word replacement doesn't work. Battlestar Galactica did a fantastic job with fracking mm -hmm. as a replacement. Right. Like it 
And, and if you're going to do word replacement, I worked with an author um, who did word replacement in his sci-fi fantasy story. And it was phenomenal because um, he did it based off of time. We talk about hours, minutes, days, months, and years because we're reliant on the sun. Mm. Out in space, you're not reliant on the sun. So he replaced each of those words with non-sun based words to create this division of time and it was fantastic he didn't have to explain it to the reader he just mm. replaced it and used it consistently and the reader was able to just take it in i was all inspired by it because i'm all inspired by writers right but um but it wasn't just word replacement. It wasn't just, I'm going to call that object something else. There was a purpose to it. Like you were saying, there's a meaning behind it. Why are, Why is he changing this word? Why doesn't it make sense? Mm -hmm. um, but it, it comes with an understanding of and a respect for how language is invented. It's not just a series of symbols and sounds there's a meaning behind it. Yeah, so. there's purpose to it. And that and what's what I think is like if you're building as a like let's say you're building like you're writing fantasy, you're building an orc culture and you're like, oh, I want their grammar to be messed up. Just know that like when they're speaking English, right? Like I want their grammar to be messed up. Just know that their grammar's messed up because they're speaking the grammar of whatever native tongue you've given them. Not because their grammar's messed up, right? Does that make sense? Like, yes. what you're saying is that like there's reasons behind yeah. accents and di dialects, and I'm not saying you have to write a whole orc language, but you do need to know why the grammar is messed up and be yes. consistent in that. Yes. Yeah. And this comes down to again world building. If you're going to world build, if you are going to create this, you have to create rules and you have to stay within the boundaries of your own rules. Mm -hmm. You can't make a rule and then just change it because, oh, magic. Or, oh, yeah. I'm tired of this. Oh, this is hard. Writing accents and getting them right is hard. Yeah. Well, it's like it's the Yoda problem, right? Like it can be a lot of fun. You can have like Yoda has a specific way of speaking that we all remember and love but it's that maybe not love but we all remember and, but it's that like there is an assumption there that yoda actually his native language is a completely different language than what he, than what everyone right. in star wars speaks and we never hear him speak that language he's only speaking right the yeah but there there's the assumption is there's another language behind what he's speaking that causes that yeah. grammatical yeah break yeah also as we talk about yoda Yoda's appearance in the story, if I'm remembering correctly, is pretty minor. He's not in every scene. He's it is. Not, he comes right? in more and more into like the 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 other stuff, but yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty minor in the original. You can't, yeah, you don't get a whole whole movie with Yoda. Right. <laughs> There's no Yoda movie because it's a lot. That would be very hard to pull off. It drives right? us all crazy. We'd be now, like, oh wait, I'm talking backwards the whole time. <laughs> Now, the, the opposite of that is minions, right? Minions have their own language and their own words, but it's all based off of the English, French, Spanish, romantic. Yeah. They're romance languages, yeah. right? I don't really know a lot about yeah, And I don't know that I would hold them up as a good example of this. They've kind of gotten in trouble for that a little bit. Oh, have they? They I have. Just, I just remember the originals. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. The thing about their language is that it doesn't have to make sense. That's yes. the like they're actually just literally speaking gibberish. There's not a language yeah. there. They're just like, yeah. Yeah. But they have gotten in a little bit of trouble for mm. well, putting see, them in putting go. them in overalls and giving them Spanish French accents. There's been a yes. <laughs> Well, so there you go. This is a problem. Yeah. Keep yourself um, out of trouble by just don't do it unless you have to. Or okay. like you were saying, if you are bringing your own culture in and you're writing for English features, yes, absolutely. But in order to do that, you already know the language. You already mm -hmm. know what's respectful. You already know. And that's why you're doing it um, as a cultural example. And I think I think all of these rules are guidelines. Uh, we think of them more as guidelines. Um, sorry, anytime anybody says that, Pirates of the Caribbean. Anyway, um, I digress. Never mind. It doesn't matter. It depends. It's
Just, yeah, it depends. Just be respectful. And the, oh, that's what I was saying. These guidelines are for English speakers who have only spoken English mm -hmm. and have only written English. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm yeah. done. Please change the subject so I can stop. Babbling. Okay, so. I shall. Um, last one. Laura, what's the difference between scenes and chapters? Oh, scenes and chapters. I love this. Scenes are for storytelling. Chapters are for readers. So a scene is an event that happens start to finish with no break in your timeline. Chapters are places where authors stop and start their story strategically to craft a reader experience. So often we put a chapter break right smack dab in the middle of a scene because we don't want our readers to go, I'm going to read this chapter and then I'm going to go to bed. Mm -hmm. If you stop a chapter in the middle of a scene, people want to finish. They would be like, dang it, turn the next page. Yeah. Right? So yeah. they're going to keep reading. Um, so yeah, that's the difference. Yeah. And I'd say, no, I think that's great. I'd say we spend too much time worrying about transitions between scenes. The reader doesn't need them as badly as you think they do. The reader doesn't like, if your scene changes location and like you're in you're in the kitchen and then all of a sudden you're in the living room in the next scene. I don't necessarily need you to t describe for me the walk between the kitchen and the living room. If it's intuitive, yep. if it's all not you intuitive, you have to explain it. it. Yeah. Exactly. But I don't, I don't need, or let's say one scene jumps two weeks in time. If those jumping two weeks in time is important to the story, I need to know that if it's not, I don't actually care. Right. Like it's about what's aiding and empowering your story. So like, I don't need to know everything that happened in those two weeks. I don't need that paragraph. I just need to like, you can literally just say two weeks later. And yeah. you may not even need to do that. Right. Like you may. <laughs> I So I'm, I'm actually going to push back on that one. I agree with everything you said until you said you might not even need that. You need to give your reader space and time. They need to understand that there has been a gap. But like you're saying, they don't need to know what happened in that two weeks because you yeah. skipped ahead as an author two weeks because that two weeks didn't matter. And it depends on the story. Like sometimes time is less important in a story. And this is this is like, I think, more a newer perspective for me than I've had in the past. Because if you asked me in the past, I'd be like, tell me the time passed. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I've been reading stories recently where I'm like, I don't think it matters that it took three hours to get there. They were leaving to get there and then they were there. And that's right. all that matters. It doesn't matter that it took, you know, four hours to go from here to here because it's not important to the story that time passed. Um, no, but yeah, the, the idea that there is a journey has been planted in the reader's head. Yeah. So they know that there is a passage of time. Yeah. So in but that, that case, but I don't need to know exactly what it was. No, like I just, yeah. you know, I know that it's there. It's intuitive that it's there. Yeah. I don't need you to tell me four hours later. Right. Right. And lots of times you can use cues in mm -hmm. your writing. They sat down to dinner. Yeah. Time of day. They, they yeah. left. If they left before lunch, yeah. they, they're sitting down to dinner. That's a passage of time. You don't have to say, it's been six hours yeah. since we were in the car, right? Like those those elements of the world and what's happening in the moment mm -hmm. give us those anchor points because we all know what it feels like to spend three hours in a car or eight hours at work or yeah. four hours in a yeah. shift, right? Like we know what that passage of time feels like. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't need to, in, in if that's the, yes, I agree with you completely. Yeah. Or like a dumb creative example would be like, you know, man, this was a great Saturday. Julie said in scene Wednesdays were Julie's worst days. Yeah. yeah. I have to tell me what happened Monday right. and Tuesday. Was, you know, Wednesdays are Julie's worst days. Oh, it's Wednesday now. Okay. Here I yeah. am. Right. Yeah. Like that's, you know, 
but yeah, I don't. I think we worry more about the linearity of yeah. our storytelling when it's really the emotionality that the reader's connecting to. And what's way more important is the emotional strand than the linear timeline of yeah. what's happening. You Unless, can skip linear steps as long as the emotional journey is coherent. Yeah. Um, Unless yeah. you're telling a story that's time bound. If you were oh, yeah. running up to, like if you're yep. running up to a major event um, and the passage of time is important, like you've got a countdown story. Mm -hmm. um, if you are um, in like a detective novel and the passage of time becomes really important because the first 48 hours and all of yeah, those yeah. things, then your time becomes a component of the story that you need to mark. And you yeah, it, it becomes it becomes an influence on the emotional coherence of the story because right. as time passes, that intensity revs up. So Absolutely. like, but again, it's that emotional coherence that's important, not the clock in and of itself. The clock yeah. is only important because you've attached it to the emotional movement yeah. of the story but Absolutely. yeah the other time that time is important how many times can we say time time um, is important it depends how much wood could a woodchuck talk of wood talk could chuck wood way to pull it in yep you're, you're welcome, welcome. Lon. uh yeah um so the other is if your story is not told in sequential order if mm -hmm. you jump around in time, so you're yeah, telling part of the story and then you, you have a flashback yeah. or a flash forward, yeah. then you have to orient your reader to time. Yeah. In the same way you orient them to space in every chapter segment. Yeah. Unless they live on a pod and then if everything happens in exactly the same room, like um, room. Oh, how I, fun would that be to write a book where there is no time? where everything happens at once. I think that you are setting yourself up for a big challenge because you're creating reader burden because readers mm -hmm. understand time. And and it's in a future dodgeball arena. I'm this is what I'm talking about. That. I was just going to say that. Future <laughs> dodgeball arena. Yeah. So and it's narrated by an AI. Is, Reader burden is real. It is. And I make it all the time. Um, no, all right. We're, don't. I do all the time. About? Uh, yeah, I'm terrible. Um, okay. We're, we're out of time. Um, everyone for your questions. Yeah. That's Laura, fun. final thoughts. You can't throw final thoughts at me. That's like not fair. I'm sorry. Who used to do the final thought? That was Jerry Springer, right? Since we're talking, this is where we're like totally dating ourselves. Oh my gosh. It's Jerry Springer's final Springer. thought. No yeah. One. Nobody threw a chair. I don't think we can do a final thought. Dang it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you throw a chair on a podcast? I guess this is for mm -hmm. YouTube too. So we could technically throw a chair. Absolutely. We could, we um, could throw a chair anywhere. Yeah. If I threw a chair on a podcast and it would didn't make a know? sound, would they know? Did you really throw it? Did I really throw it? Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> I think that was our final thought. And anytime anybody talks about thoughts again, going back to since we're leaning into it, Deep Thoughts by Jack Candy. By Jack Candy. I recommended my 21-year-old go go listen to that yesterday. I was like, you should go listen to Deep Thoughts by Jack Candy. Because he was <laughs> saying something that sounded profound but was not. And I was like, you'd really like this. And he was doing it on purpose. So I was like, you'd really like this. would make you laugh. Yeah. My favorite yeah. one was the one about if you saw an old lady fall in the street you'd laugh and then until you realized that you were the aunt that she fell on oh <laughs> wow yeah that's a good that's a solid okay yeah final thoughts final thoughts if you want to learn more about editing we got the cohort for you oh way to bring it back or hey. you know, just listen to the podcast because we yeah. say profound things on the podcast all the time. Do as we? long as you understand our 80s references. Do we? That's right. Yeah, sign up for the cohort by August 1st. Um, and with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna close this out. So everybody go get words on page. Thanks, Laura. Bye. Bye.